Hey, welcome to another edition of Faith Greater Than Fear. Again, my name is Mike Schrage, and we've been doing here, even in 2021, continued episodes, not as many, but just every once in a while taking the best of the best. And this is one of those episodes. And so I like with one of the speakers and said, you know, it's just not wise to waste a crisis. Let you mull on that a moment and then welcome and watch and listen for the next 15 or so minutes, some of the best insights from some of today's great leaders about what God's teaching them personally and in ministry. I know you won't want to miss this kind of remix of what God is saying as we look at our faith. Be great out fear. Welcome. Church is never going to be the same again. It's just not. And so how do we make the transition to not only having a great physical presence, but how do we have a great digital presence as well. What an opportunity. And so, you know, I, I, one of the things that drives me crazy is when I'll hear a church leader say, yeah, but I'm stuck in this little church in this little town in Shelby, Ohio. And I'm thinking to myself, no, no one is stuck anywhere anymore. There are no boundaries when it comes to digital, right, Mike? I mean, the church in Shelby, that little town, can now be reaching multiple states in the United States but also have a community developing in China. It's crazy right now what the opportunities are. And this pandemic, as bad as it is, God is bringing, I mean, it's a scriptural principle. Uh, God will bring good out of, you know, every what might seem bad right now. And this is an opportunity for the church to move forward. My neighbor was not going to walk into our big auditorium of our home church. He, he just wasn't not. It, it's somewhat intimidating for a, an unchurched person. But our na unchurched neighbor is very likely to join us for brunch on a Sunday morning and to watch a 45 to a minute to an hour long gathering online with us. And then to, in a non-threatening way, talk about what we just learned and encountered on that thing. So I think prophetically what I would say is go after this, engage it. This, this is something that, that churches are going to do. New church plants are doing it. And the business world's been doing it. For decades already, you know, we can learn from them. That's not a bad thing. Capture everything for good. Are there downsides? Are there evil sides to the internet and digital? Absolutely. But it's what we make of it, okay? So let's capture it for good, and God will bring good from it. I've been amazed at how resilient um, most of our pastors have been around the country. Most of them were not online. Uh, many small churches didn't have the technology. I'm amazed at how quick many of them adapted. That, that to me was phenomenal to see that, that response of, of flexibility. I, that's the positive. I think the negative of all the pastors that we're working with and talking to in all size churches, what's really uh, exhausting them is the uncertainty. Because uh, most, most of leaders tend to be strategic, they're planning, they're thinking, that sort of thing. And all of a sudden, they don't know how to plan because they don't know what's going to happen next week or next month. Most preachers are telling me they believe we're going to come back with a great revival. I don't think so. I don't think the church is ever going to have the attendance back what it was in the local building in years, but that doesn't mean the church can't be more powerful, but we've got to be the church that goes out versus the church that just invites everybody to come in. And a lot of our groups went to Zoom or Google Teams meetings so that they haven't really missed a beat. They've, they've stayed together and they've stayed connected. And that's been, um, that's been huge. Um, early on, my, my message to the church was um, the church is not shutting down. The church never shuts down. Um, God is giving us a chance to see that we are not, our, our identity is not chained to our large group gatherings in our nice buildings on Sunday. And I, I just, I shared that most of the rest of the world has never been able to worship like we worship. And in fact, the largest church in the world in the history of the world, meets in scattered home groups, largely in secret, underground, all over their nation. And 
they report to us that 3,000 people come to Christ every day in their country, and that's China, uh, one of the most oppressed churches in the world. Sometimes I think we have to ask, whose kingdom are we really building, God's or our own? And I've realized during COVID-19, there's a lot of habits in my life that God never asked me to do, that I do them because I'm afraid of losing something. And, and, and what am I afraid of losing? You and I were talking at an earlier stage. You know, I hope that one thing we learned during COVID-19 is that we need to be more passionate and more possessed with disciple making, with people's lives being genuinely transformed, people far from God coming near, rather than enamored with how many, as they say in New Zealand, I think I can say this, how many bums are on the chairs. <laughs> that's a favorite phrase of mine I learned from my New Zealand days. And uh, when I first heard that, I thought, well, that's kind of crass, but really, they understand the difference. And I think when we go through times like COVID-19, my kids, my wife and I have been talking, what about our rhythms of how much time we spend together? You know, we had the date night, okay, but what happens in the date night? Are you really talking? Are you really engaging? Or is it just one thing you're clicking off the calendar again so you can move on to the next item on life or the day agenda? And so this has forced me and my wife, and my, both my kids have told me the same thing. It has forced all of us to go back and have that non-negotiable where we have our time with God, where it becomes, you know what, I'm going to have this time with God because I need God. And, you know, it goes back to the old Chuck Swindoll phrase, you'll never know that Jesus is all you need until Jesus is all you have. And I think it's interesting that what's been attacked during COVID-19, you know, our, uh, our wealth, our income, uh, our ability, our liberty to travel, our, our ability to do so many things, it's almost like God said, okay, I'm going to help you focus on me again. I think that busyness and urgency are really lonely companions. And I think that we've befriended them too often. And I think that just slowing down a little bit has really helped my wife and I see that uh, we're not going to befriend urgency and busyness as much moving forward um, in the name of ministry. <laughs> For some people in ministry, this has been a down, a down tick in busyness. For others, this has been high, kick it into overdrive. And just to be honest, man, like I'm, I'm tired. <laughs> I'm tired. I, there are a number of people on our team that have just been going nonstop. The meetings hit an uptick. They didn't hit a down tick. The urgency hit an uptick, not a down tick. There is no way that I would have been able to make it through this season if I did not prioritize Sabbath in the 10 commandments, what it takes up the largest chunk of scripture to explain to the Israelites. It's not murder. It's not stealing. It's not adultery. It's the Sabbath. Right. And I think that in our culture, oftentimes the hustle and the grind and the busyness you're exemplified, the more that you, that you say that you're burning and it's really hurting right now in ministry, you're not valuable to anybody if you're burnt out. So take, ask God to do more with six than you can with seven. That's, that's what I'm learning more and more all the time to do is to find the day. If it's not worshipful and it's not restful, I'm not doing it. I'm not a slave to my phone and I'm not a slave to the urgency of the busyness. I think we've got to get to a spot where we are um, less and less in control. Mm -hmm. I think ministry or discipleship. Um, I, don't, I don't know if, you're, if your audience is familiar with disciple making movements. Um, I don't know how... Um, how controlled they are by men. I think they're really controlled by the spirit. And I think we've got to get to a spot where we're, we're okay <laughs> with not controlling every little nook and cranny um, of what's happening. Um, I think uh, something I tried to talk about last night was um, DNA. Um, what kind of DNA do we have? And is it the kind that can replicate, that can multiply and, um, and go out beyond our control. Um, because if it takes a master's degree and a full-time job to make it happen, it's not going to go very far. But if it's simple, if it's sticky, it's too good to forget. And if it's scalable, ooh, baby, like that's good stuff. Like that, um, I think that is the kind of stuff that Jesus, um, that he did in his life, you know, is, is he did things that like, um, a prison inmate or a fourth grader could, could do it. You know, it's not necessarily easy, but it's simple. Um, 
So, you know, as church staff, I think we've got to get used to letting go of control. It truly was the goodness of God and the generosity of, of churches and donors that allowed us to make it through what is, you know, not even arguably, it absolutely is the, the worst season in the history of CIY, the most difficult season we, we have ever faced. And that's, that's even come from Andy Hansen as he was, you know, he's been there 35 years, was president for forever. It's just such a, such a great man, but he would say it's been the hardest season we've ever faced organizationally. Um, you know, some of the things that, that we set out to do is we said, man, we're going to lift up Jesus first and foremost. You know, our problems are no bigger or no different than anyone else's. And our posture right now needs to be one of generosity. Uh, and, and I said, man, I, I want our team to be known for two things. I want to be known for our generosity and the fact that we love the church. Whether or not CIY continues into the future or not, I want us to be remembered for those two things, our generosity and our love for the church. I would never want uh, believers to walk around being smug or arrogant, but I would encourage you to start walking around with confidence. Because the last mm -hmm. time I checked, the gates of hell can't stand against us, let alone a COVID. Uh, and, and, and we will get through this because we are the body of Christ. We are resilient. We're strong. We're tough. We faced darker days than this. This is not our darkest day. By any stretch of the imagination, this is not our darkest day. He will win this, and the church will prevail, and we're not going away. We're not going to back down. And so I think for some who've got that kind of defeatist attitude because they can't get together this week, or how long is this going to go on, I guess my challenge to you is with just an air of absolute confidence because your faith is in Jesus Christ, and we know who he is and what he's capable of, Remember, we will win this. We cannot be taken down. We cannot be defeated. The gates of hell can't stand against us. I'm of the opinion that every crisis is a God-given opportunity uh, to discover Jesus Christ in new ways. And it is possible to waste a crisis. And so what this crisis has done, the pandemic, um, it's affected people mentally, emotionally, spiritually, physically, and financially, and even relationally. But I've watched people take the crisis and use it as an opportunity to get to know the Lord better and to draw closer to Him and to deal with various areas in their lives, which they have left um, untouched, so to speak, that the Holy Spirit was putting His finger on. When the world is at its worst, the church is at its best. We have to be the calm in the storm. And when everybody else runs uh, away, we run too. And there's actually strong documented evidence through church history, every pandemic, Christians have been the best nurses, the best caretakers, because we don't fear death. And so literally twice during the Roman uh, Empire, first few hundred years of the church, a pandemic destroyed between 15 and 25% of the population. But Christians actually grew, not only in, in percentages, but in numbers because of their compassionate care for other people. And we're poised to do that again with the coronavirus. I think looking back, not only will it be one of the best gifts to families who now have to we can't focus on finances because that's shot, but we focus on meals in homes. We focus on connecting in calls. We focus in worshiping God and praying fervently. That can only strengthen the fiber of families. And if families have a spiritual fiber, finances will always follow. So I'm not actually worried about the economy. It's one of the ebbs and flows, which we will always have but the family has been under such severe attack for so long, this actually may be one of the greatest gifts of God to our families. Hi, wasn't that some fabulous nuggets? I mean, just in highlighting again, just a few things people said, you know, in a small church with today's technology, we can go anywhere. You know, if we lift up Jesus and if we're generous, we are going to win. God's going to win, not the pandemic. The gates of hell are not going to win. God's going to win. He's the one who's going to remain standing. And when the world is at its worst, the church is at its best.
Those were just some of the summaries of some of the nuggets that I hope you enjoyed in this last remix version of Faith Greater Than Fear. If you enjoyed it, please share it on your social media channels. We know there are others who would be blessed by it. We also have a podcast version. And so in another couple of weeks, we'll have a fresh version, an interview of Faith Greater Than Fear. So until then, God's blessings on you. Stand strong and have a great day. Thank you.